Welcome, Welcome to, to the Wright Lab. Lab. Hi, I'm Jerry Wright. I'm the director of the Michael DeGroote Institute for Infectious Disease Research here at McMaster University, and I'm also a professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Biomedical Sciences. I'm absolutely blessed to have people uh, come from all around the world uh, to come and work with us here at Mac. That includes um, students and, um, and staff from all over Ontario, uh, from uh, Southern Ontario, Northern Ontario, from the prairies, Saskatchewan, Alberta, from British Columbia, from out east to uh, Quebec and the maritime provinces that we've had. Um, folks come from pretty much the entire country uh, to come and work with us over the years. Um, colleagues from around uh, the United States as well, um, all around the world, all throughout uh, the United Kingdom and Europe and India and China, parts of Africa. So really just an amazing group of people who have really come from all over the planet to try and solve these big problems here um, with us in my lab and at the Institute here at McMaster. I'm absolutely delighted to have uh, to introduce to you what's happening in our lab. Uh, I work with a, just an amazing team of people who are all trying very hard uh, to try and solve one of the biggest problems we have on the planet, which is uh, antibiotic resistance and, and what, how are we going to get new antibiotics. We're bringing lots of different technologies to bear on this, this problem, which is really uh, an existential threat to modern medicine. So antibiotics are absolutely essential to modern medicine. And they're the reason why we can do crazy things like open heart surgery or, or cancer chemotherapy. And we're always in a race because the bacteria become resistant to antibiotics. They're unique among drugs in that, um, that resistance is always going to be a threat. Um, bacteria will always find a way to become resistant to antibiotics. And so when they do, um, we need to find new solutions to be able to, to overcome. And that's part of what we're trying to do in, in my lab. Understand resistance mechanisms. Where do they come from? How do they evolve? And what can we do to help solve this problem? To tell you a little bit more about antibiotic resistance and what we're doing in the lab, here's Summer. Hi, my name is Summer and I'm a PhD student in the Wright Lab. For my research, I am trying to find new drugs to treat parasitic worm infections. When antibiotics were first discovered, many of the infection-causing bugs were treatable with those antibiotics, meaning they were susceptible. One particular bacteria shown here is called Bacillus subtilis. We've grown it in the lab on a petri dish and then put these discs that have different antibiotics on them to see which ones kill the bacteria. Bacillus is mostly susceptible or is killed by these antibiotics because there are these zones of no growth or inhibition. Over time, bacteria either evolve or gain antibiotic resistance, similar to learning new skills, and eventually some cannot be killed by any antibiotic that we have available, like this particularly bad bug known as Pseudomonas aeruginosa that is resistant to all the antibiotics spotted on this plate. In almost all places we have looked, we can find bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. Researchers have looked in the rainforests, in hot springs, in agriculture, including farms and animals, in remote, untouched caves, and even in humans, in the human microbiome or gut. Many of you might only think of antibiotic resistance as being something found in the hospital, but almost everywhere we've looked, we can find it. So how exactly do bacteria become resistant? Resistance is generally something that is coded into the DNA or genome of bacteria. Bacteria have their own set of genes which encode proteins that form specific machinery in their cells. These mini machines can modify, destroy, or prevent antibiotics from working against bacteria. In our lab, we try to understand these proteins in many ways. One way is to determine their 3D structures. Understanding the 3D structures can help us to design inhibitors, or other drugs to tackle resistance so we can continue to treat these bad bugs. 
one of the areas that we're really interested in in, in, in our lab is to go back to the original source of antibiotics um, for medicines, that is the microbes from the environment, bacteria and fungi that live in the soil in particular, which are the source of most of the antibiotics that we have in the clinic today. Most of the drug companies went away from this source of, of antibiotics, looking to find other strategies to be able to find new drugs. And it hasn't worked out really well. So we've gone back to that old source. We really got excited about the opportunities now using modern methods of, of discovery that includes genome sequencing, high throughput screening, and, and synthetic biology, that we can actually go back to the microbes that live in the environment as sources of new antibiotics. And to do this, we created a library of microbes in our lab called the WAC library. And that uh, library is about 15 to 17,000 different fungi and bacteria that we've isolated from a variety of environments, uh, mostly in Canada, but in, uh, with colleagues around the world as well. And this is a source of tremendous chemical diversity in the area of antibiotics. And we're mining that to be able to find new drugs, new strategies to overcome uh, infection and to be able to find the medicines of the future. So I'll tell you more about the WAC collection in the lab. This is Haley. Hi, my name is Haley and I'm a PhD student in the Wright Lab. I first joined the group back in 2017 and my research project interests include uncovering novel forms of antibiotic resistance and understanding antibiotic biosynthesis. As Jerry mentioned, we have a large collection of bacteria that we use for various research goals here in the lab. This begins by taking soil samples from the environment, which we can often do by going into our very own backyard, such as Coots Paradise here in Hamilton. We then bring that soil back into the lab and try to isolate or grow bacteria and fungi from that soil sample. We use various different medias or nutrients and agroplates to grow different bacteria. And after about a week or so, we look to see if any unique colonies are growing on these plates. As you can see, many of the organisms we isolate from soil have unique colors and morphologies when we grow them here in the lab. These are some examples of the bacteria growing on agar plates. As you can see, they produce various pigments. One compound that they produce is called geospin, which you've probably heard of before because we often associate it with the smell of rain. The next time you smell that distinct smell, just remember that it's actually geospin being produced by bacteria in the soil. Now I'll pass it back off to Jerry to introduce another aspect of our research here in the IIDR. So with the WAC collection, we're able to access chemical matter that is really quite um, remarkable and, and also very bioactive. But to screen these uh, extracts that we make from this, from the WAC library, we need obviously high throughput methods. There's a lot of samples involved. And so we use robotics in our uh, high throughput screening laboratory here at McMaster um, to be able to go through uh, thousands of different iterations against uh, organisms that we care about uh, trying to inhibit. The platform that we have is state of the art to be able to do that. And we're adding to it all the time. The other element of the process is we've, we're increasingly taking our wax strains and then purifying or partially purifying the molecules that are in them. We call that our natural products library. Here to tell you more about the natural products library and high throughput screening in general and how we're using it to find new antibiotics is Adam. Hi, I'm Adam Schenzer and I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Wright Lab. My projects involve working on antibiotic adjuvants and co-culture experiments for regulation studies. As Haley and Jerry mentioned, we can use our large strain collection in various ways. And one way has been to try to extract or harness all the compounds that these soil organisms can make in the lab. Once we've isolated the bacteria from the soil, we store them in a freezer that we can go back to at any point. If we want to see what compounds a bacteria can make, we will first use a crude extraction process, followed by various purification methods as demonstrated here by Fay and Manpoot, two postdocs in our lab. These purified extracts can then be tested against other bacteria, like the Bacillus or Pseudomonas mentioned earlier, to see if there are any compounds produced by the soil bacteria that inhibit or kill them. Caitlin here is setting up plate manually, but we can also use robotics, as Jerry mentioned, to automatically test multiple extracts at a time against a bacteria of choice, like a multi-drug resistant superbug, for example. In a whole day, we can test thousands of extracts, 
and the next day we will have an idea if any extracts contain a potential antibiotic that kills the superbug. Now I'll pass it back off to Jerry to end our tour. This is just a little bit of the activities that we have ongoing in the right lab right now. They'll have enough time to tell you all the different things that are up, that are happening, but we're deeply interested in trying to solve the biggest problems in medicine right now. And whether that's uh, finding new antibiotics, new antifungal drugs, anti-malarial agents, uh, or even new ways to treat parasitic infections. And we're really quite excited about the opportunities um, that we have going forward. It's an amazing team, an amazing place. Um, and if you want to learn more about it, check out therightlab.com. That's therightlab.com. So the Master's is an amazing place to do science. We uh, have a tremendous group of faculty, staff, students who are all trying to tackle some of the biggest problems that, that we're facing today. This kind of research is happening at McMaster and it's happening in an exciting part of, uh, of the world. It's, uh, it's right on the shores of Lake Ontario, um, tucked into the Niagara Escarpment. It's a beautiful campus. One of the great new initiatives that we have at McMaster is something that we're calling Canada's Global Nexus for Pandemics and Biological Threats. We're living through unprecedented times right now, as we all know, dealing with the COVID-19 and its after effects. We're going to be dealing with these kinds of challenges for years to come. Um, and we've really understood that what it takes to solve these big problems is not just scientists, um, but also social scientists and humanists and business people and um, companies and governments and not-for-profit organizations all working together to try and solve big problems like pandemics, like biological threats. And what we're trying to do here at Mac now, thinking forward, what, how can we contribute to society over the long term? By building this initiative out at McMaster, we're trying to, to address these things head on. We're gonna be there before the next big challenges hit with the tools, with the skills, with the people to be able to tackle these big problems. So you can come and join us at McMaster, join the Global Nexus, um, it's going to be a tremendous ride, lots of things to do in the future, and we need the brightest minds. So thanks again for joining me and my team on our little virtual tour of the lab and of the Institute here at um, McMaster University. It's an amazing place to be. I wish you all the best of luck on your journeys. And when you're thinking about the future, think about us.